Okay, here we are, chapter eight of the Chocolate Touch. And in the very beginning, we see a picture of a <clears throat> trumpet and some music. <clears throat> I wonder what's going to happen when he tries to play his trumpet. <clears throat> English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll distributed words. Mrs. Plimsoll distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she, ex she explained as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words John noticed. Avarice, indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one, it seemed to John as though they had all a special bearing on his present uncomfortable condition. At last the bell rang. Very well, class, Mrs. Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mrs. Mrs. Plimsoll. Mrs. Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal, and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin in the school orchestra, and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time, Susan hurried on ahead of him, John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at their music stands on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Mrs. Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girl who played the flute. Just after Jay sings, nestlings chirp and flee, she was saying, you come in with your trill, doodle oodle 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 oo. Do you see? The place on your score? Good. Ah, John, Mrs. Quaver exclaimed, seeing him in the in his place. I'm glad you're not absent. As I have just told the others, this afternoon we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of A Boy's Song by James Hogg. We've been over all the individual parts and all the sections, you will recall. Now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened his trumpet case and took his shining gold trumpet from its bed of scarlet velvet. The beautiful new instrument gave him confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for at least two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line, that's the way for Billy and me. Good, Mrs. Quaver said. And don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. You want to play ta-ta, 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 simply repeating the rhythm of the voice. And I want you to be light and lively. This is supposed to be the song of a boy who loves romping in the country. Ta-ta, 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 John thought. That shouldn't be too difficult, even with the whole orchestra listening to him. He had played it over and over again at home. We would ha he would have to try extra hard here. This was to be his first solo. Everyone else was depending on him to play it properly. Right, said Mrs. Quaver brightly. With her baton, she rapped twice sharply on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow over the strings of her violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinist and the cellist made their wheeling and thumping and whumping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the introduction, one of the older boys began to sing. Where the pools are bright and deep, where the gray trout lies asleep, up the river and over the lee, that's the way for Billy and me. After the last line of the first verse, John's fellow trumpeter echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. Mrs. Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance and with her baton gave the singer the signal to begin the second verse. Where the blackbirds sing the latest, an oboe went. Where the hawthorn blooms the sweetest, where the nestlings chirp and flee, the flute warbled according to plan. That's the way for Billy and me. John swallowed with an effort and put the mouthpiece of his trumpet to his lips for his solo. 
The mouthpiece instantly changed to chocolate. Then, almost as fast as the chocolate, then almost as fast, the chocolate spread along the instrument, changing all the flashing gold into dull brown. The first note came out fairly true. Ta! But chocolate trumpets cannot withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and clogged, and the valves stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play ta ta tu ta tu ta It sounded as though John were trying to play a soap-filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Mrs. Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was racked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over toward John's chair and picked up the trumpet. It's a chocolate trumpet, he shouted. <clears throat> no wonder it sounded like that. John Midas was trying to play a chocolate. John didn't wait to hear any more. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway and homeward. Chapter 9 starts with a picture of, it looks like, a container for bobbing for apples and a party hat. <clears throat> oh, the shame of it. The humiliation. John wept breathlessly as he ran, shocked and frightened, indignant and angry at the world that had suddenly turned against him. Mean old things, John thought, blaming Mrs. Plimsoll and Mrs. Quaver for his failures, even though nothing that had happened to him had been their fault in any way. Horrible old school, he thought, even though he had liked school until that morning. Hateful Susan, he thought, even though he knew at the same time that he was really longing for her to be friendly with him again. Through the window, Mrs. Midas saw John coming up the pathway. Hello, John, dear, she called from the living room. You're home early today. How nice. As a reward, there'll be a piece of chocolate after supper. I hate it, John shouted. He was crying too hard to say anything else for the moment. When she heard the sound of his voice, Mrs. Midas rushed into the hall. Why, what's the matter, dear? She asked, putting her arm around him. John twisted away from her grasp, ran past her, and started up the stairs toward his bedroom. Susan doesn't want me at her birthday party, he said as he went. I know she doesn't. Well, I don't want to go to her rotten old party anyway. I don't think you really mean that, Mrs. Midas said. Besides, she added, and John was halted by the softness of her voice. Mrs. Buttercup just telephoned to say she was going to drive over herself at four o'clock to pick you up. She did, John said, blinking down at his mother from the top of the stairway. Yes, she did, Mrs. Midas assured him. So, you'd better hurry and get yourself washed and brushed. Your party clothes are laid out on your bed. There were games on the Buttercup's lawn while it was still warm enough outside. Later, the party supper included the birthday cake, including the birthday cake, was going to be served indoors, and there would be a magician and a short movie. John joined in the blind man's bluff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese, and soon he became more cheerful. He even temporarily forgot about chocolate. Susan looked very pretty. Her yellow curls had been brushed so hard that they looked silkier than ever. She was wearing a big blue ribbon, the same color as her eyes. Her cheeks were flushed with excitement, a deeper pink than her new party dress. On her feet were dainty little white socks and white shoes with straps that buttoned. Between games, Susan smiled at John and said, I'm glad you came. They seemed to be on good terms again. Then, Mr. Buttercup approached, bringing a bucket of water from the garage. He set it down in the middle of the lawn without spilling a single drop. We're going to duck for apples, Susan whispered to John. The boys against the girls. You can be captain of the boys' team. The two teams lined up for the race, Susan leading the girls and John the boys. The idea is this, Mr. Buttercup explained. When I say go, not yet, John, Susan and John will run to the bucket. There are 12 apples floating in the bucket and 12 people in the race. Using only their teeth, Susan and John will grab their apples and run back to their lines. As soon as they touch the hands of the number two runners in their teams, Dinny and Duncan, Susan and John will go to the end of their lines and Dinny and Duncan will run to the bucket and duck for apples. Do you all understand the way it's going to work? All right. One to get ready, two to get steady, and three, two, go! 
Susan, bounded ahead like a jackrabbit, and had her face deep in the bucket by the time John reached her side and crouched down for his apple. He got his eye on a big red one, with its stalk, with its stalk jutting up conveniently for him to grab. He lowered his face, opened his mouth, and lunged. Somehow, his nose reached the apple before his teeth did and pushed it below the surface of the water. John's mouth followed the apple down. Then, a terrible thing happened. The clear water in the bucket turned into dark brown, sweet, liquid chocolate. Susan and John immediately pulled up their heads, but it was too late. Their faces were drenched with chocolate syrup. Oh, Susan exclaimed, wiping chocolate out of her eyes. Chocolate syrup dripped down all over her delicate, pale pink dress. Oh, she moaned. John was in the same state. There was <clears throat> chocolate all over his face. There was chocolate <clears throat> on his white shirt front and on his gray flannel shorts. And there was chocolate in his mouth. Glug, John said. Glug. Susan was too surprised and angry to speak. For the second time that day, she turned her back on John and ran away from him. Mrs. Buttercup offered to clean John up but he couldn't bear to stay at the party another minute. He started off at once for home. Okay, I'll be back tomorrow with the next two chapters.